Welcome to the Perspectives on Healthcare podcast, where members of the medical community from different roles, venues, and locations share their unique perspectives on quality healthcare, its future, and how to improve it. Now, from the Your Keynote Speaker Studio in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here is your host, Rob Oliver. Thank you, and I appreciate you being with me today. I, I am I'm very excited because I'm bringing a perspective to you that literally comes from the other side of the world. My guest today is Richard Harris. He is from the land down under, uh, land of sunshine and sharks uh, is what I've been told, but uh, he is a vascular surgeon down in Australia. He is a member of the baby boomer generation and um, located in um, Sydney, Australia. Uh, Richard, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Rob. Great to be with you. Yep. Wonderful. Um, of course, being from Sydney, Australia, uh, you wouldn't happen to know where P. Sherman uh, at 32 Wallaby Way is. Uh, he come... <laughs> well, no, I haven't, I haven't, oh. haven't been there lately, no. Uh, okay, so just... I'm sorry, it's a reference to Finding Nemo. Uh, the, the yeah, dead, right, right, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah no, I so, haven't, haven't been there for a while. What, all right, then let's jump into the actual reason why I have you on the podcast. Uh, tell me about yourself and your role in healthcare, please. Yeah, I'm a, um, a vascular end of, we call ourselves endovascular surgeons these days because the role of a vascular surgeon has just changed enormously in the last 25 years. We've uh, as have so many specialties and uh, particularly surgical specialties have gone toward minimally invasive uh, ways of doing things. So where I was attracted to this massive specialty where you're operating and uh, making huge cuts in people all over their bodies. And nowadays we can often access them through little tiny punctures and groins and, do, and basically operating on people on uh, TV screens. So it's, it's just such an incredible revolution in the way uh, we do things compared to, to 25 years ago when I was training. So yeah, it's it's um, it's a life of uh, technology using using that in combination with trying to maintain the, the the holistic approach to the patient that I've always tried to maintain. Um, and yeah, I, I, I set aside some time in my life to be a, a writer as well. So that's another joy of my life. So I have two two wonderful careers really, uh, medicine and and writing. Wonderful as a as a fellow author, I you know, celebrate your creativity. Um, and you're doing something that's way more difficult than me. Uh, um, you're writing fiction and um, I'm writing nonfiction. Nonfiction is a lot easier because you don't have to make things up. Um, and if you do make things up, then you get in a lot of trouble for that. Um, yeah. But for um, the creative side of writing it, very impressive. And um, I celebrate that for you. I, yeah. What does quality healthcare mean to you? Yeah, I think, you know, I like to look at, at healthcare on, on a world basis, and, and I think the most important things is quality is the the actual ability to to access a standard of care that's that's excellent, and you'd like to think that that could be applied worldwide, but also equity and um, the ability to to get to that. So I, I've had the pleasure of working in the NHS in England. I've had the pleasure of understanding the American. Um, health system fairly closely, somewhat in shock. Uh, and I've had the pleasure of working in my healthcare system, which is kind of a, a hybrid between the more socialistic NHS and the more privatised American healthcare system. So I, I kind of like our balance to a certain extent where, where public patients have universal access and, and pretty promptly in most cases, so and good quality. So being a uh, an advocate for uh, the highest quality and easiest access for, for everyone. I see it more as a human right than, a, than something that, that has to be uh, shared out by, by monetary opportunity. Okay. Yeah. So talk to me then a little bit about the, the Australian healthcare system, if you don't mind. I mean, you mentioned it kind of being a hybrid. Uh, what would you say are the strengths of the system and what are areas that you might see as being detrimental in the system? Yeah, so uh, there is uh, absolute private, there is private medicine. So you can insure and about 42% of the Australian population has private insurance. And that does vary by demogra 
demographics a fair bit. But on the background of that, we have uh, universal health care, which was introduced in the 1970s. And there was a lot of controversy about that now. But people in, in Australia now completely embrace that as the backstop and the kind of the underlying um, backbone of, of Australian health. So even private medicine is subsidised by the government. If you do a procedure, you'll, you'll get a, a fee or the patient's episode will be partly paid by the government, partly paid by insurers. And it, it works relatively seamlessly. We're, we're kind of frightened of the insurance companies having more of a say in, in how that's delivered and, um, you know, um, them making the decisions for patients rather than, than the best advocates, which I think are the, the health professionals to do that. So we're trying to maintain that um, the advocacy on one hand versus how it's, how it's modelled on the other. We, we don't, I think we have quite good efficiencies in our system. Uh, and there's competition almost between the public and the private sector. Mm. You, who can provide the better service there's a lot of pride in the public hospital system here i work in both i work in public a public hospital and a and a big private hospital as well and yeah there's there's definitely you know who's going to actually have the best vascular hybrid suite to to operate on in a modern way for people um and that's that's great that there is this sense that uh, the private the public hospital can keep up with and even sometimes surpass what the private hospitals can offer uh so yeah, I think that's that's only good for the patient ultimately. Sure. Negative things. Oh, gee, I don't know. I just I just see that when I look back on working in England and you had these, uh, uh, you know, a clinic with a thousand people and there's twenty doctors in the clinic seeing people over four or five hours and you don't, you know, they could be sitting there in that horrible chair in the clinic for two hours with breast cancer and they're seeing some anonymous doctor. It, that's not. I don't think that's an ideal sort of setting for healthcare or quality healthcare. And on the other hand, I've seen American vascular surgeons pondering, can they use that wire? Because that wire is going to be $150 and that's going to come out of their, their budget. Mm-hmm. Whereas we kind of say, well, we need that wire to get through that that particular blocked artery and we, we do it. Okay. So, I mean, there, there's a couple of breaks on our, our, our system as well, but... Um, some anomalies, but it generally works pretty well, that, that kind of combination of public and private medicine. Okay. I, and yeah, it sounds like you, um, in the States, when my kids were little, um, you know, 10 years ago, there was Hannah Montana and she was all about the best of both worlds. So uh, yeah, can you give me an example of quality healthcare? Yeah, um, I, we had, well, just, I think Australia's approach to COVID in general was quality healthcare. Um, we had we had the ability as an island nation to shut our borders. You know, that's pretty tough. I haven't been out of the country in two years. Mm. Uh, it's a massive radical thing, but we've only had about 1,500 deaths and, you know, in the whole country in the whole time. And now we've got a very highly vaccinated, very highly compliant uh, population. We're up to 99% in one territory where my particular state's greater than 90 four percent vaccinated already and we didn't start you know for a couple of months after america so we can now open up uh, fairly safely and and we're doing that so, you know even in that sort of macro public health measure we've we've done well on a micro level you know early on i had a beautiful 91 year old lady with covid and she survived six of the people in her residence did not and, um, you know, 45 days out from COVID, she's there and she then sends an embolus to her legs. We were able to sort of fish that out and get her home a couple of days later. And I remember just sitting on the side of the bed chatting to her and, and said, you know, how do you feel about the, the people that you lost and in the uh, nursing home? And she, she, she kind of just stared and she, she really couldn't, she couldn't come up. And she was totally mentally with it, but she just really couldn't handle that. But... I think, yeah, that's the, those sort of moments where you've got doctor and patient sort of reaching for each other. I think they're, they're the real great moments of, of healthcare. Yeah, a very powerful experience. And even, even in just being with a patient who is having trouble verbalizing the, the feelings that they have and just to be able to be there for them. I, what do you wish people understood about your role in healthcare? Um. I think I think what well we need 
I, I like the idea of educating people and I'm not afraid of expressing myself in many different forums about um, where I see the positive way that we can deliver healthcare and, and, and not just healthcare, but all sorts of social justice issues. So I, I'm happy to get out there. And I think a lot of surgeons are a little bit more hermit-like and they're, they're sort of within themselves and they, they just do their job and get on with it. And they do a good job, but they don't necessarily... And they don't get the message out about what what they're achieving, why they do things. So yeah, I think being able to express yourself and explain what you're doing to people, but in that, particularly when they're in front of you and you're trying to uh, tell them why they might want to have a procedure or not have a procedure, um, is a huge thing. So I think also the balance that you get with experience about not doing things to people that's another uh, very important factor. I think some young Doctors tend to overdo things when they they feel too confident or too cocky and um, are doing procedures that they probably shouldn't be doing. So I think that comes a bit with experience, uh, when to hold back as well. So, yeah, it is an art still to a certain extent, um, how you communicate with people, how you explain procedures, um, what they can expect from procedures, uh, and not to overcall it and not to over-exaggerate things. It's so interesting to to hear what you just said, because um, I've used the analogy on the show before, but, you know, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so um, I would imagine that when you're trained as a surgeon, you can, you're, there's an initial instinct to think, I know how we can address this through surgery, but you're saying, uh, let's take a, let's take a step back. And before we talk surgery, let's talk about other options. Is that is that properly understanding what you said? Yeah, and I think it's not just uh, the surgery part of it, but it's also what yeah, what other alternative programs, exercise programs, or dietary things that you can look at uh, to prevent recurrence. I mean, smoking is a is a, a great thing. I mean, I, I have stopped many many people from smoking over the years, which is a I think a pretty good achievement, even just in one person. But um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's 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 definitely not all about you know I've got to just go and book this person for another operation. That's a ridiculous approach to surgery. You've got to be you've got to be able to appreciate the person as a whole. Um, I've always disliked some surgic, surgeons' attitude that it's just about the procedure. And they don't want to know about the the medical side of things. They don't want to know about all the other issues. And I think that's a, a, a really silly way to approach surgery. But surgery is a, is is very rewarding in the sense that it's an instant gratification a lot of the time. There are some things that are so obvious, like if somebody comes in with appendicitis and you know you take take the appendix out and they you know in the old old olden days they would have died of, of sepsis, but um, now we can you know, fix them up and they go home the next day. So there, there, is a, there is a lovely instant gratification to surgery quite a lot of the time. Yeah, but, although with surgery, it's interesting because the only person that is not aware, that doesn't receive the instant gratification is the patient, right? Because you, as the surgeon, as the members of the team, you're all there and you're seeing what's going on. You're able to say, yes, we were able to do this. Um, and yet the only person who doesn't participate in that um, fully, for the most part, would be the uh, the patient themselves. Uh, yeah, I, said, I mean, say in, in the, that's very true of the old days of horrible surgery. So, if I had a person who was uh, had an ischemic leg in the old days, we'd have to do a fempop bypass. That, that's such a huge operation. You know, all these cuts on the legs and these wounds and coming through the pain of that. Uh, but nowadays, I can do a puncture in the groin and fix them with a balloon or a stent or an atherectomy device and they go home the next day and they don't notice they've had a puncture in the groin and they can walk um, as far as they like, whereas the day before they couldn't. So there is, there is some things that are, that are, that are you know, yep. so, for, the, for the benefit of the patient really oh, quickly. Oh, no, uh, um, sorry. Um, my my um, idea was not that um, they don't, they, they see, you know, once they wake up, they're seeing yeah. the results very quickly. Um, just, yeah. Um, when they are under anesthesia, they are not um, participating. Oh, that was that was yes. kind of where I was going with that. Um, yeah. What excites you about the future of healthcare? Yeah, well, I've got a, a son who's uh, a med student, so that uh, excites me that I, that I've got a quality uh, man coming through to 
to take over, not me, but but just in, in the field of medicine. Like I, I know he's just a fantastic guy and, and I know that some of his friends are as well that are doing the course with him. So I feel that there's still great people coming through to, to, to push medicine forward. So that's a wonderful uh, knowledge. But also, you know, as technology comes through more and more, uh, it'll be less invasive, more successful. Um, I think the artificial intelligence is going to aid in um, diagnosing things quicker and, and more accurately. And, you know, it's kind of sad to think that the pathologist isn't going to be looking down the, the microscope to, to work out what, that, what cell that is. Um, but, yeah, I think those, those things are exciting. Even in vascular surgery, there'll be imaging techniques that will take the wire through that I won't have to sort of guide it or you know do, use an angiogram. It'll just you know, work its way through like a Tesla in, in traffic. So right. I, I see these things that, that are very obvious that will come to, to medicine, this sort of t- technology applied to what we do. Um, but there'll still need to be the caring and skilled people to, to guide that technology. So I, th- I think we've got a long way to go. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh- what is one thing medical professionals can start doing today to improve the quality of healthcare? Yeah, I um, I'm a great advocate for um, not putting your hand on the doorknob of a of a consulting room before you've made sure that you've you finish your conversation with the patient. Mm. So there was a wonderful speech actually given by a president of the vascular society in, in the states once and it was documented in the, one of the journals and it was just a beautiful kind of uh description of, of what not to do and what to do as a doctor and what that was one thing that always st- struck stuck with me is that don't stand up don't finish a conversation until it's finished and you had the opportunity of the patient having to ask all the questions they want to have and it doesn't matter if you've got a a room full of cranky patients out out the front. The important thing is the person in front of you and 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 uh, connecting with them properly and getting them to understand what you're what you're on about. Yeah, so. I, I think is a, a very powerful message that um, you're saying handle the handle the patient that's in front of you and let the rest of it get handled when it gets handled. So very interesting, yeah. uh, wonderful. Hey, listen, I really appreciate you being on and I. Real quick, if people are looking for your book, um, what's your book called and um, where can they find it? Yeah. So this is it. Uh, Imagine a novel by Richard A. Harris. Uh, website is richardaharris.com. Okay. Um, and you can just Google Imagine a Novel and uh, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it in any good bookshop if you ask them. And it's a great read. It's There's a bit about healthcare in there. There's quite, quite a bit. Um, it's a vision about John, well, it's taking John Lennon's song, John and Yoko's song, uh, as in a novel form. So it's envisioning a, a change of heart, a change of, of the world order, if you like, to en- enable that uh, kind of world to exist with no borders, no war, no crime. I mean, it's, um, it's, it was a joy to write, but it, there, you know, there's so much in, in the equity of world healthcare and education of healthcare and the, and the way that uh, skills are distributed in the world that, that could be instantly changed if there was an imagined day and everything changed that day. Um, that's one aspect of, of uh, the book, but yeah, it's, um, it's a, it's a series of love, love stories. And um, part of, part of love is getting proper healthcare out for everybody. I reckon in the world. Yeah. Um, part of love is not losing the ones that you love. So um, yeah, no, Richard Harris, thank you so much for being with me today. I appreciate your perspective on healthcare. Thanks for listening to Perspectives on Healthcare. Visit perspectivesonhealthcare.com to learn more about Rob Oliver or to subscribe so you never miss an episode. If this podcast was valuable, we'd appreciate a review on iTunes. Or if you tell a friend or coworker about the show, that would be helpful too. Join us again next time for more Perspectives on Healthcare.